Hello and welcome to this edition of the Wireless LAN News Desk Weekly. My name is Tom Carpenter. I'm the CTO at CWNP. And today we're going to be talking about two things in the news related to wireless technology. First, we're going to address an announcement from a vendor of Enterprise 802.11 AX APs coming a little later this year. And then second of all, we're going to be talking a little bit about Wi-Fi in the home and why that matters. So first of all, this issue of 802.11 AX. Arrowhive actually announced their 802.11 AX AP line coming later this year, earlier this week. And this is not the first announcement of an 802.11 AX AP that's kind of marketed to the enterprise space. There was another before it, and there will be more to follow. The question that we have to ask is twofold. One, what are these APs going to offer? And two, what is this issue of releasing a device while the amendment is still in the draft phases? So we'll talk more about the draft issue a bit later, but first I wanna focus on something in the specs for this Arrowhive 802.11 AX AP line. A couple of the APs list something in the specs that may not be familiar to all wireless LAN specialists out there. It's something called 802.3BZ. Now, what in the world is this? So we tend to think of Ethernet as just 802.3. Those of us who study wireless LANs, we look at 802.11 in a lot of ways. We talk about 802.11n, 802.11ac, 802.11ad, et cetera. We're used to talking about amendments. But with Ethernet, because it's, well, seemingly not as frequently that we get new physical layers, we often just say 802.3. But new physical layers are added to Ethernet in the same way. So over the years, we've added 10, 100, 1,000 megabits per second, and then higher data rates on Ethernet. So what is this thing called 802.3BZ? Well, it's kind of an intermediate data rate set between gigabit and 10 gigabit. What we have is two and a half or five gigabits per second, depending on the implementation, the cabling that you have to support the speeds and so forth. So for example, if you do the 2.5 gigabits per second implementation of the 802.3BZ amendment, you're going to need a minimum of CAT5E. Now, most people would probably use CAT6 with new installations, but a minimum of CAT5E to get those 2.5 gigabits per second data rates. The five gigabits per second is going to require CAT6 in most cases, there are some very special use cases, but generally we just say CAT6 is required for the five gigabits per second. So what this does is it addresses this concern people have with the wireless side of the APs getting faster and having multiple radios on the wireless side of that box that is the AP and only one gigabit ethernet uplinks on the back of the AP. So for example, if you have two five gigahertz radios and one 2.4 gigahertz radio in an AP, the concern is that you could saturate that gigabit uplink and not have enough speed. So just in case you see that 802.3BZ and you're not quite sure what it is, that is the issue there. Time will only tell if 802.11AX eventually exceeds the demands of one gigabit per second. On a large scale, we really haven't seen 802.11AC exceed the demand of one gigabit per second. But 802.11ax with sufficient client saturation, we would hope might be able to do that. And we'll see why as we talk about what 802.11x is all about. And we'll do that a bit here as we talk about the draft. So I mentioned that these devices that are coming out now have to be based on the draft of 802.11ax. And the reason is that it's not ratified yet. So it's gotta be based on the draft, right? Well, draft 2.0 as of November, 2017, actually had 3,350 comments on it. Now, the way this works is as an amendment goes through the draft phases, comments are made on the draft saying this wording is not right, that wording is not right, or this just won't work at all and you need to change it to the other. So there are comments. Those comments then go by an editor. Then they're sometimes submitted to specific groups that deal with specific sections of the amendment and so forth. And they end up choosing whether to incorporate the comments or not, what changes need to be made, etc. So to give you perspective on this, draft 1.0 had 7,418 comments and draft 1.0 had 453 pages in it. Now, after those comments were processed, we ended up with draft 2.0 at 596 pages. So let's just roughly say 150 pages more or so. 
Now, about half that number of comments are there in draft 2.0 than what we had comments for draft 1.0. And so it's very logical to think anywhere from 30 to 50 pages of additional content could be added to the amendment based on these comments. It depends on, of course, the type of comment. But the point here is that the amendment is not ratified yet. There are still changes taking place. Draft 3.0 is currently scheduled to go under review for comments in May of this year. And then of course, we'll eventually have a vote to finalize it. Currently the plan is to be voting on that finalization at the end of the year and it'll be ratified early next year or late this year. So what does that all say? Well, it says there is some potential danger in using a device that's based on a draft amendment. That potential danger comes from the reality that we're going to have to have an update to ensure that it is completely compatible with the ratified amendment to the standard. Now, that update may be able to be done through firmware to take care of everything, as long as the radio chipset has everything in place that's needed there. It may mean that that particular device will never be fully 802.11ax capable. In the past, with 802.11n, we saw draft devices come out, and in most cases, those draft devices just kept right on working just fine after the amendment was ratified. So I don't want to set up some kind of a sky is falling scenario here. I don't think that's the case at all, but I do think it's something to be cautious about and to pay attention to as we go through this process of devices coming out. It is also important to know that as we read about the benefits of 802.11ax devices, particularly here in this early stage with consumer routers available and some client devices being released that support 802.11ax to remember that our pool of 802.11ax devices is minimal to in many environments zero right now. So installing AXAPs isn't going to give you any AX benefits. It might give you some benefits with optimized chipsets and filters and things like that that will improve the performance of the AP, but it's not actually going to give you AX benefits. So since we haven't talked a lot about 802.11ax in any of our webinars at CWNP or anything like that, I thought that today might be a good chance to step back and talk a little bit about what 802.11ax is supposed to be all about. And I'm going to do that in a bit of a novel way. Whenever a amendment, whenever an amendment is created for the 802.11 standard, it always starts out with something called a PAR, P-A-R, a Project Authorization Request. In that PAR, they state the primary goals of that new study group that's going to be developed of that new amendment that's going to be created. So I've pulled a bit out of the par for 802.11ax just to talk to you about their goals. So let me share with you some of these goals. The first stated goal was that the focus of the amendment is on wireless LAN indoor and outdoor operation in the 2.4 and 5 gigahertz frequency bands. So this is not a 60 gigahertz change. It's not a sub 1 gigahertz or TV white space change or anything like that. 2.4 and 5 gigahertz. Additional bands between 1 gigahertz and 6 gigahertz may be added as they become available. So later amendments could address those. Then it says the increase in average throughput per station is not limited to four times improvement. Improvement values in the range of five to 10 times are targeted depending on technology and scenario. Okay, so they're saying we're setting a goal to increase the average throughput per station by five to 10 times. Let's listen carefully to that. Let me state it again. The goal is to increase the average throughput per station, not the throughput per station. We're talking about the overall throughput within an area, not just within a BSS, but within an area. What is the overall throughput there? So they do indicate that further as they go on here in their specifications. So they suggest that average throughput per station is directly proportional to both aggregate BSS throughput, that's all the clients connected to an AP, and area throughput. So this average throughput per station is going to be about what can I get in a coverage area, physical space, in other words, a physical area. How can I increase that average throughput per station? So notice the primary focus here is not necessarily on increasing the top end possible data rate for a single client. Although they do that, they add a new 1024 quadrature amplitude modulation. So Yes, there are higher data rates for sure, but it's not just about increasing data rates for individual stations. It's about increasing the average data rate across the board for those stations. We want to lift that average up. And that's really the key here. This is why this is called the high efficiency wireless LAN or HEW. 
So 802.11ax or the HEW Phi is all about increasing efficiency while on the side also adding some higher top end data rates. Now they go on to list other things as well that are very important, but I want to share with you these three sub bullets. They say these scenarios highlight three categories of objectives to improve wireless LAN efficiency. Number one, make more efficient use of spectrum resources in scenarios that have a high density of stations per BSS. So a primary focus here is to look at a high density BSS where there are a lot of stations connected to that access point. Second, significantly increase spectral frequency reuse and manage interference between neighboring overlapping BSS or OBSS in scenarios with a high density of both stations and BSSs. So the twofold goal here is let's look at a BSS that has a lot of clients and make sure that's as efficient as possible. But let's not stop there. Let's look at a high saturation of multiple BSSs with a lot of stations and make sure that's as efficient as possible. So think about a corporate office building where you might have five or six or seven different wireless LANs all on channel six or more, and they are trying to function as best they can. So now we've got not just possibly a high saturation of clients per BSS, but a high saturation of BSSs that are stepping on each other in that space. Finally, they want to increase the robustness in outdoor propagation environments and uplink transmissions. So there's a focus in there also on improving uplink transmission rates, which you know with 802.11ac, we had downlink multi-user MIMO, which hasn't really panned out to give us significant value at this stage of the game. Uh, but now we want to add uplink multi-user MIMO as well. So time will tell what that does for us. But I just wanted to give you some of those insights into 802.11ax goals without really getting into the technical details of how it's all being done. We'll reserve that for webinars and things like that. Now, with all of that said, all of those goals are valuable and very important. Many of them have been at least partially achieved with existing technology, 11N, 11AC, by having really good design in our wireless lands. But design can only get to a certain point. So HEW is a good idea for giving us even more out of our designs. Not, it's not going to take away design. It's not going to take away the need for design, but it's going to give us even more out of our designs. So that's a very key thing. Okay, so that was the 802.11ax announcement. We learned a little bit of information about 802.3bz and talked a little bit about 802.11ax and the issue of draft versus ratified amendments. So the second piece of the news I want to talk about was Wi-Fi in the home. And there was an interesting article at cablefacts.com that had some interviews with managers within a cable company talking about their responsibility to provide good Wi-Fi in the home. And the suggestion of these managers in the cable company is that good Wi-Fi is the responsibility of the cable company, the ISP, whoever is providing your internet link. So maybe it's DSL, maybe it's cable, uh, maybe it's a uh, 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 last mile wireless, wh whatever it is, their job is to provide you with good Wi-Fi in the home. I find that interesting and thank you because the reality is you can't assume that the vast majority of consumers are going to know anything about how to tweak their Wi-Fi or get their Wi-Fi to work better in their home, right down to the point of where they want it. Here's what the historical trend has been. Historical trend has been is an installer goes to the house to install cable and internet, right? And they've got this nice little cable router that has a built-in wireless router in it. And they set it up where? Where the user tells them to, where the customer says. They say, oh, I want that uh, in my uh, third floor office in the far corner and that's where I want you to put it. And then they wonder why at the basement floor in the other corner, they don't have Wi-Fi. Uh, or they tell them, uh, hey, I want you to just go ahead and set this up right in the basement in the other corner. Either way, the point is, where do they put it? They put it where the customer tells them to. And the managers at this uh, cable company that was interviewed said, no, 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 that's, that's the responsibility of our people to tell them good Wi-Fi. Now, let me suggest there are three things that an install tech who goes into a consumer home to set up Wi-Fi needs to be able to do to give them a good Wi-Fi experience. Number one, of course, is they need to connect the wireless LAN device to the service network. So they all know that and they all do that. That's primarily what they focused on, making sure that the box is connected to the ISP network. It doesn't stop there though. Second, they need to verify and select the best channel when auto channel selection does not which is a lot of the time. So it's very important for them to select the right channel for that to work on. 
Now, I do understand the issue. I've worked with some of the cable companies and talked with, the, with them about these issues. I understand the issue of installing this network and it has to keep on existing when new wireless devices come in around it and things like that. And so I understand the motivation for auto channel selection. I really do. But if you're going to have auto channel selection in your devices, you need to do what the enterprise vendors have been doing with um, RRM and, and other solutions and you need to make sure it's getting better, it's being optimized, the algorithms are improving, they're being tweaked and optimized, and maybe have some different default profiles for your install text to at least choose. Like this is the configuration of auto channel selection that we're gonna use when we install it in an apartment complex. Uh, this is what we're gonna do when we install in a house that's separated by 350 feet from any other house outside, meaning we're gonna disable it and choose a channel, right? We're not even gonna use auto channel selection. The point is, that the different spaces can demand different things and a lot of improvements can be had there. And then finally, the third requirement. So first requirement, get connected to the service network. Second requirement, get the right channel. Third requirement, ensure sufficient coverage and capability throughout the residence. So they've got to make sure that the right coverage is everywhere in that space. Now, interestingly, uh, some cable companies have resolved, if you're only listening, I just did air quotes, They've resolved this problem by having people install Wi-Fi extenders throughout their house. And, okay, we've used wireless LAN repeaters in enterprise in the past. We don't use them in enterprise anymore. There's a reason for that. They don't work that well. Now, let's step back. If you go back a few years where most people had a 10 to 20 megabits per second internet pipe connection, then using a wireless extender is probably not a big deal if mostly what they want to do is connect to the internet. Losing half my throughput isn't that big of a deal in those scenarios. But if instead I'm using a 500 megabits per second internet pipe or faster, then that Wi-Fi extender could become a throttle for me. Now, it does depend on how they use. My suggestion to ISPs, cable providers, whatever, look into mesh solutions instead of repeater solutions. So if you're calling it a Wi-Fi extender, but it's really a mesh capable device, one radio to talk to the main wireless router and one radio to talk to the clients, then that could be an acceptable solution. If however, there's one radio that talks to the client and to the wireless LAN router, probably not an acceptable solution for many modern high speed internet connections. So let's make sure we're thinking it through properly. Now, the good news is that it's exciting for me to see that these cable providers and other ISPs are looking at this and realizing they need to be the ones that help these consumers have good Wi-Fi. And the reason that excites me is because we are also on board that ship. We want to make sure that these organizations have what they need. That was part of the motivation for CWS and CWT to create these certifications for those entry-level install techs that need those basic capabilities to get that job done. So I'm glad to see that the cable providers themselves in this interview were saying, yes, it's our job. I agree 100%, so let's have better Wi-Fi in the home. Well, let me say thank you for joining us today for the Wireless Land News Desk. And if you haven't already, make sure you click subscribe to subscribe to our channel and find out when News Desk broadcasts are going out and webinars are archived and other videos that we place online. If you click the bell, you'll even get an alert. Thank you very much for joining today.